This is Revolution at Sea with John Curtis Perry. Episode 29, A New Maritime Society. A new maritime society emerges. This new society arose amid a changing maritime environment. Today, shipping is Pacific-centered, not Atlantic. The leading world seaports are not Felixstowe, Britain's biggest, 90 miles northeast of London, or Port Newark, the Atlantic North America's largest. The major users of bulkers and boxes are in Pacific Asia, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Chinese ports, notably Shanghai. The container has wrought life change at sea as well as in port, for seamen as well as for longshoremen. Seamen formerly could join the merchant marine and see the world. They now see only the ocean. And here emerges a third operative word describing the third episode of oceanic revolution. Endurance, volume, and now speed. Containers, computers, and cost concerns have compressed days in port into hours. Now a ship can put into a port in the morning and leave in the afternoon. Despite putting into some exotic places, the crew has no opportunity to enjoy life ashore, and many new ports, remote from urban centers, offer little to the visitor. We're bloody tram drivers, that's what we are, seamen say. And driving has entered the lexicon, perhaps illustrating the intermodal character of these changes. The internal combustion engine propels the ship. You drive the box to its destination at sea or on shore, and be it truck or rail, diesel is king. Bulkers aboard offer spacious, even luxurious quarters, like hotel suites. Sometimes wives come too, e even bringing whole families. Seamen work four months on, four months off, but the container ship is less pleasant. The cargo leaves no deck space to enjoy. A journalist describes life aboard, which he defines as a world of the TV screen. The crew, he says, never see the light of day. They don't look like sailors, but like tired clerks when gray-faced, they come to the mess to have their meals. Le Havre and Cherbourg were once favorite ports of call. Some of their bars were famous. You could get your mail there and meet up with the girls. Perhaps this wasn't quite moral, but that was part of a sailor's life. Now, the bars, cafes, and dance halls are empty. I sat with the captain one evening and told him that I'd always wanted to be a seaman. He sneered, not at me, but at the world. Me too, he said, and I had my wish, and I'm sorry. The sea is now boring, and it's dangerous. The worst of both worlds. Malcolm McLean never thought of that, I bet, he said. The port of Boston's Mike Leone says, if you've seen one port, you've seen one port. Ports exercise various kinds and degrees of influence depending on the ways in which they are used. Man many focus on one commodity, oil, or one mode, the container. But traditionally, certain commonalities existed. Ports spawned related industries, fish processing in my hometown, Gloucester, at many ports now, it's oil for refining and storage. Tank farms are a familiar sight. But more industries used to stand at water's edge. Steel forging, flour milling, sugar refining, bulk items. Of these, we now have nostalgic mementos. 
Although not beautiful, the iconic Domino Sugar sign on New York's East River in Queens had many fans, and in response to their feelings, the current developer of the property promises to retain it if in a different location. A bittersweet solution, as someone put it. Today, many immigrants, often illegal ones, avoid ports. But ports traditionally were sites for major migration inflows, providing demographic diversity. People were often segregated ashore by choice. Ethnic and intra-ethnic tensions were common. Waterfronts were identified with crime and corruption, gangs, and in Asia, secret societies. An overcrowded environment and constant inflows made for vulnerability to infectious diseases. The physical structures reflected a densely populated waterfront. Because a port required large numbers of workers to handle cargo, ports had to be in cities where labor was readily available when needed. Labor chose to live near work, with periodic employment dependent on patterns of ship movement, making for a volatile environment. This was characteristically casual, sometime employment, rather than steady, regular jobs. It put strains on family life. A sense of community was enhanced by danger and the physical exhaustion of the job. Unions were strong and characterized by intense militancy and sometimes organized crime. Dramatists have exploited the theme, such as Elia Kazan's On the Waterfront, starring Marlon Brando, or the more recent TV series The Wire. But the unions negotiated high wages for those who do have jobs, and that continues in the container age. Before the late 20th century, the greatest seaports were foci of oceanic societies. Their distinctive character was dominated by the tastes and ideology of merchant elites. The communities were characterized by diversity, pragmatism, a measure of tolerance, and a spirit of merchant-driven entrepreneurship. Now this is gone. The old seaports, the Hudson River, for example, provoke an elegiac mood. The finger piers of the East River, the Hudson, or the Thames are obsolete or gone, materials for the archaeologist. They offer only the smell of salt water, the sight of a decaying pier, the harsh sound of an occasional gull. These provide sensory reminders of the cultural impact of change. The destruction of the traditional seaport community, the removal of its function, challenging what once were thriving inner cities like Liverpool with its prosperity, its very life fed by the port. New requirements have transformed the shorescape and beyond. Shifting maritime industry led to a shift of manufacturing and resulting urban blight. Containers require a long space of direct deep water frontage to which a ship can tie up lengthwise, unloading, loading, storing, needing huge parking lots, in effect, for stacked boxes. Activity is thus moved to the greenfield port, so-called, open ex-urban space, sometimes rising on ecologically fragile post-industrial sites. These are often already environmentally despoiled, but they offer cheap space. New challenges arise from the need for deep dredging, dealing with polluted sediments. The diesel fumes of ships, even at anchor, in Los Angeles and next door Long Beach, ships are greater polluters than cars. 
another problem is the introduction of alien species, plants and animals clinging to ship hulls, moving from faraway places. For those at work in the ports, keeping things moving is the cry. Speed is not necessary for handling low-value bulk cargo, but vital for much of that carried in the container. Goods have a short shelf life. A lot of merchandise is seasonal. If Halloween costumes arrive in late October, their value disappears. Interest in speed is manifested less at sea than on processing along shore. Here, the computer plays a vital role. We might say that the clerk's keyboard has replaced the stevedore's hook, generating speed and volume of information flows. The computer is an essential ingredient for the shifting of self-contained goods from one medium to another, maintaining the seamless web. Steve Perkins, a Newark longshoreman crane operator, sits in his cab above a glass floor, looking down between his legs at containers about 140 feet below. A boom reaches out horizontally over the ship, and the entire crane can slide on to racks in order to cover the ship from bow to stern. The crane is vulnerable to high winds. If blowing more than 35 knots, Perkins doesn't work. The process is dehumanized. Unloading, loading occurs without the sound of the human voice, and few people are to be seen, even at a distance. But machinery is constantly in seeming robotic motion. Cranes, trucks, trains. People work in those machines, but in isolation, not in groups. This is awesome to watch, for it is a choreography of great precision, putting each item exactly where it belongs, all according to an immensely intricate and meticulous schedule. A Maersk captain says, The pressure never lets up. You can never go fast enough. But it's all remote from the public eye, unseen and unperceived. It is unappreciated. Instead, shipping is known largely for its disasters, oil spills, the Torrey Canyon, the Exxon Valdez, and as material for drama. The Titanic is always exciting, even though everyone knows how the story ends. The ultimate disposition of ships is also remote and largely unknown to the public. The scrapping is done in India and Bangladesh, where labor is cheapest and least likely to resist terrible working conditions. The process is horrendous. The ship is driven at full throttle at high tide up on the beach, then dismembered and cut into manageable pieces. It poses a major health hazard to the workers, handling asbestos, toxic anti-fouling paints, and other noxious materials. Perhaps 25% of the workers develop cancer, and so South Asia suffers the downside of the maritime experience. Let us now return to where we began, along Pacific shores, to look at the flowering of East Asia and the renaissance of China in a maritime world centered in a global new Pacific. As part of globalization, the Pacific region takes on a far greater importance. And so let us focus next on this area and its maritime consequences for all of us in episode 30, A New Pacific. Revolution at Sea is written and spoken by John Curtis Perry. 
with additional voicing by Jamie Rosenberg. Recording by 1623 Studios, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Production and distribution by Albert Buichadé-Ferré. Goodbye until next time.